Well, I thank you guys again for joining us. <clears throat> also, shout out to our online family. We love you guys. Make some noise for the online fam. Come on. You guys are the best. Uh, so if you've been with us, um, we've been in a series called You Asked For It, okay? And what this series is, uh, is it's a conversation through a lot of different topics that the congregation has asked about. So like if you were here last week, Pastor Josh talked about angels and demons because that's something that people wanted to know about. Uh, and so we're going to continue that today. And our question, we're taking a question each week. Our question for this week is what is heaven going to be like, all right? So we're going to talk about heaven today. Um, I'll be real with you. There's a lot of questions about heaven. Amen. We all have questions. I still have a ton of questions about heaven because we don't know every single detail uh, quite yet. And so um, we're going to talk about heaven today because heaven is a big deal. I think we all are curious about heaven. Maybe growing up, You've been told a lot of different things about heaven, you know what I mean? Depending on if you grew up in a different church or a different denomination or just what you were taught in your household, a lot of us have been taught a lot of different things. Maybe you were taught that when we get to heaven, we're going to be angels and we're going to have wings and we're going to fly around and we're going to play the harp, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I've never played it before, but here I go, you know what I'm saying? Maybe you're like, man, I'm just going to be like, you know, just floating around in a little diaper. It's like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruin that for you right now. There's no diapers, okay? It's like, it's all gone. You're like, wow, that was the one thing I was looking forward to with heaven. So, but maybe you thought that. Maybe you thought heaven's just going to be, you were told it's going to be this big, like, spiritual white abyss, and we're just like these orbs floating around that occasionally bump into another one. Like, what's up, Jim? You know, and then you go on to the next part of heaven. It's like, I don't know if that's exactly it either, but we all have these different ideas, right? There's a, you have a conversation with somebody about heaven, it's like, well, what about this? What about that? I don't know. Do you know? It's like there's a lot, okay? And so ultimately what we want to do today is we want to dig into what will heaven be like. Um, when we get to spend eternity with our Heavenly Father, what is that going to be like? And so we're going to look at Scripture, uh, we're looking at God's Word, and see what He reveals that we can really know and understand about what heaven will be like. And so uh, to do that, um, we're going to answer a few questions, okay? And I, and I want to say this as well before we answer those questions. Um, I think it is a good thing, okay? As we have gone through this series, it's a very good thing that we all have interests when it comes to God's Word, about who God is, about heaven and stuff like that. Um, there's a verse here in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3.11, that says, Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so... People cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. We can't see all that God does or he's doing every single time, right? We have a lot of questions and that's good. When we talk about something like heaven and eternity, it's good when we can realize God has planted this desire to know more about what he's done, about his plans, about his creation. He's planted that in our heart. So it's good that we have interest and it's obviously the goal um, is to, to learn more because it's something that we should desire is eternity with Jesus. So again, what we're going to do to, to kind of get a better answer um, to our question, what will heaven be like, is we're going to actually answer uh, three different questions, okay? Multiple questions. And I'll just give you a warning. I, I'm a fan of points, okay? <laughs> I like to go, I have a point, And in that point, I have more points. And in that point, there is a sub point. <laughs> it's just kind of how I work, okay? So uh, stick with me as we go through it, because ultimately we will get to uh, a big point, okay? Uh, so stick with me. But three questions about heaven to help us better understand what it will be like. Uh, so the first one, First question is, is heaven an actual place? Okay, is heaven an actual place? Uh, to better answer that question, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look uh, at a few different types of heaven. You're like, what are you talking about, different types of heaven? If you look at scripture, um, we see the word heaven pop up in a lot of different places. And actually, it's referring to a few different things, okay? Uh, so I want to go through what those parts of Scripture might be referring to when they talk about heaven. So the first one, and this one's really just for some context, okay? This is just to help. Uh, this is not necessarily a version of heaven, because we will have two of those, okay? Just a sneak peek. Uh, but the first one I want to talk about is the sky or outer space, Okay, here's where this comes from. If you read through scripture in the book of Genesis, Genesis 1, it says this, says, and God made the expanse and he separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so, and God called the expanse heaven. 
So here's what this is. Depending on the translation of Scripture that we read, sometimes when we read, we will see the word heaven come up in reference to the sky, in reference to outer space. And the reason that I'm telling you this is just to clarify so there's less confusion as to what heaven will be like. Because sometimes I think we read a, a translation of Scripture and we will take it to its most literal form and go, well, it says that heaven will be this. Heaven is the sky. So we'll be in the sky in heaven. It's like, okay, don't exactly know that, but I know that in that moment, in that part of Scripture, they're specifically talking just about this sky. Does that make sense? And so it's good to just know context, to know that sometimes we see that word, and it's not exactly what we think. It's, it's not talking about exactly what we think it might be talking about. So that's the first one, again, just for context. Now into the two big ones, okay? Um, because like I mentioned, I do believe, and we see in Scripture, that there are two different heavens. Everybody say two. Come on, let's go second service. You guys are two, second service, let's go. That worked out great. Um, so there's two different heavens, okay? And you, so for some of you, I'm just destroying things. You're like, what are you talking about? This is blasphemy, heresy, all of it. So the first one is called paradise. Come on, say paradise. Come on, we think paradise, we're like, I'm chilling on the beach. I'm hanging out in the sun. It's nice outside. It's beautiful. Paradise. We all have our own idea of what paradise is. So this is the first heaven that scripture refers to, okay? And what this is, is paradise is the heaven that people go to now. If someone is, is to pass away now, they will go to this first heaven called paradise, okay? So what is paradise, okay? Again, if someone is a follower of Jesus, they will go to paradise. So what does this look like? We, we get this uh, idea of paradise and, and, and the fact that this is the first heaven from the moment where Jesus is on the cross. Do you remember that moment where Jesus is on the cross? And you remember that there was two criminals beside him, right? Also both being crucified. Well, there's this, this kind of uh, moment between the three and one of the criminals is just not being nice. You know what I'm saying? He's kind of being a jerk and he, he, he's just kind of uh, being disrespectful to Jesus, doesn't believe Jesus is who he says he is. All this kind of stuff is happening. But then the other criminal on the other side of Jesus is like, hey, bro, to the first criminal, do you know who you're talking to? You know what I'm saying? It's like the other criminal recognizes that Jesus, and he believes that Jesus is the Messiah. He believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And so he has this moment with Jesus where he just affirms that, and he tells Jesus this. This is Luke 23, verses 42 through 43. It says, then he said, the criminal said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today you will be with me in what? Paradise. I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. So this is where we get this idea of paradise from. Jesus is getting ready uh, to die, right? And then these criminals are as well. And Jesus goes, hey, I want to let you know, because you believe me, believe in me that I am the savior of the world, I want to let you know today, not tomorrow, not later, not after a little time spent in purgatory or a nice long nap, I'll come back and get you. No, no, no. Today, you will be with me in paradise. So what we learn from this is a few things. First and foremost is that as followers of Jesus Christ, if we are to die today, today we go to be with Jesus in paradise immediately. We get to go and spend time with him. Again, it's not, yeah, when I, growing up, it was something I always thought, and what I was taught is like, it's basically a long nap. You ever, like, come on, if you got to take a nap on Thanksgiving, you ever had one of those naps where you wake up and you're like, yo, what year is it? You know, it's like, Whoa. That was a good one. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's an idea. It's like, do we just sleep? Are we resting until the return of the king? And then, and then we get back up, you know, and he's like, oh, it's time to go. So no, no, no. Today, we will be with him in paradise, okay? So that's, that's the, the first thing that we need to understand. So maybe you're wondering, okay, that's cool. I'm thankful we get to be with Jesus in paradise. That's the first heaven. But what is this paradise actually like? Because that's the question, right? Like, what is heaven going to be like? Or at least let's start off with what is this first heaven going to be like? The truth is we don't absolutely know. We don't totally know what it's going to be like. But two things that we do know, okay, is one, we get to be with Jesus. Can I get an amen? Let's go. It's like, that is the most important part of paradise. That in itself, being in the presence of our Savior, is paradise. And not only do we get to be in His presence, but we get to be completely in His presence. No more sin, no more brokenness, restored with Jesus, resting, hanging out in paradise with Him. That's a big deal. 
we get to be with Jesus. So that's the first thing. The second thing that we get, that we see from this in paradise that we know about it uh, is actually the word paradise. If you look at a translation of it, um, there's a Greek translation of the word, and it is paradisos, okay? Paradisos. And what this translates to is a park or a garden, okay? So we'll be with Jesus in like some kind of beautiful garden type deal, hanging out completely with him, enjoying paradise until the day we get to go all be together for eternity. And uh, that word paradisos also is used in another translation from the Septuagint, okay, all throughout the book of Genesis uh, to describe the Garden of Eden, okay? So if we look at that, we can take it and see like, hey, this is kind of God looking like, you know, he does this thing where he always makes a full circle, you know? And it feels like he's doing that here where he's like, hey, I'm taking you back to the original intent of this place I intended for my children, for my people to be in a beautiful garden, to be in this place of paradise with every need met completely with Jesus, okay? So that's number one. Everybody say paradise. Come on. Paradise. That's number one. The second heaven, okay? And this is where we we get to the place of, hey, the king has returned. Jesus has come to get his people, and now we get to be with him for eternity. What it says in scripture is that there will be a new heaven and a new earth, okay? New earth is the second version of heaven, the second heaven that we look at. So this comes from Revelation 21. Uh, If you want to follow me, we're going to read through a couple big passages of scripture, um, but they're great. I'm telling you, they're exciting. So Revelation 21, starting on verse one says, then I saw, and this is the apostle John, right? So he's even given a glimpse of what the future and eternity will look like. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was also gone. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. So we've got paradise and then we have for eternity, new earth, right? New heaven. The old earth is gotten rid of and made new, okay? It is wiped out and made brand new. If you don't know this about our heavenly father, he likes to do this thing uh, called resurrection and he takes something that has been just completely destroyed or killed or put to death and he makes it brand new. But not only does he make it brand new, he makes it better than before, amen? And we believe that that's what he's gonna do with our earth here is that he takes our earth and he makes it brand new. He completely restores it, okay? He doesn't just make it, oh, this place is good. No, he makes it perfect. Okay? He comes in and he makes this earth perfect. Everything in the earth, on the earth, will be in its perfect form because that's what God does. And that is who he is. He is perfect. So what this actually means is when the new earth comes, when we're on the new earth and spending eternity, is we will experience a lot of no mores. Okay? A lot of no mores. What this means is no more pain, no more struggle, no more hate, no more violence, no more pollution, right? No more sin, no more disease, brokenness and loneliness, no more. All the things that are of this earth that cause strain, that cause uh, issues, that that cause problems, that that result as the fall of man, right? That are the results of the fall of man and because of sin will be no more. There will no longer be anything to separate us from our heavenly father. So again, the world itself in its most beautiful form, right? That's the first thing. Imagine that. Have you ever been to the top of Mount Scott? And you've looked out over the really flat lands of Oklahoma. Beautiful, right? Some of you are like, I've seen better. No, it's, it's beautiful, right? Like a picture like Mufasa. <laughs> and he's like, oh, everything the light touches. You know, it's like, that's kind of what it feels like. If you've seen it, think of the most magnific- magnificent view you've ever seen. Just beautiful. Now imagine that like in its perfect form with nothing to mess with it. Nothing but how God originally intended it to be. That's what it'll be like. And not only that, again, but we will be freed from all the things that we were struggled with on this earth. We will be made perfect. We will be made whole. We will be restored. Um, one of the things that uh, I love to, to share is just, it's, it's such an encouraging thing is uh, a few years back in, in 2017, my mom passed away. And when she passed away, uh, you know, there's a lot of tension and struggle and, and, and just frustration and, and just sadness. And of course, all those things come with that. But um, one of the things that God laid in my heart that I was so thankful for because I got to share it with my family um, was my mom was a follower of Jesus, and, and, and because she had passed away, we missed her, but she was no longer in pain, 
right? She had struggled with cancer. She had struggled with addiction. She had struggled with a lot of things, and all those things were completely gone. The moment she went to paradise, and when she goes to eternity with the rest of us, all those things are gone. No more. Jesus perfects it. God makes it all brand new, and we get to be with him. We get to experience freedom and joy with our heavenly father. And that, that right there, again, that is the best part. Verse three, right? I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. God has made his home with his people. Nothing stands in the way. There is no gap between the father and his kids anymore. Fully embracing, fully experiencing and, and connecting, we will be with our heavenly father. Finally, amen, in that way. Praise God for that. This is exciting news, church. This is a big deal. Uh, it's, again, we, we have ideas of like the abyss or the harp and the angel, and we're like, oh, like, sure, wings would be cool. Don't get me wrong. It's Pastor Josh, we've, had, we, we've heard him. If you heard him preach this before, he, he really thinks, he's like, hey, man, I hope we have wings. Me too, okay? It would be sick. I want to fly around. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, all that aside, we get to be with our Heavenly Father. It's not just some abyss. It's not just some random thing where we're just like doing the same thing over and over. And it's like, is this, is heaven going to be boring? I think heaven is going to be more than we can even comprehend or imagine because it is created by somebody that we cannot fully comprehend or imagine. You know, it's like he, God is so big. He's so good. It's going to be amazing. So God made his home among his people. And to to answer our question again back, is, is heaven an actual place? Yes. We believe heaven is a real physical place that we will get to be here. Again, one paradise, but two here and this new, this renewed earth with Jesus, with our heavenly father. And I also want to say this, like maybe you're in here like, okay, but like I've heard, like what about the streets of gold? You know what I mean? Like the pearly gates. What about all these things we've heard about? So this actually comes uh, from that same chapter in Revelation. Verse 15 says, uh, the angel who talked to me, again, John held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city and its gates and its walls. So real quick, if you're a construction worker, you like to get, you know, your hands on, all measuring tapes, solid gold, okay? It's going to be sick. Um, when he measured it, he found, he found it was a square as wide as it was long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. Then he measured the walls and found them to be 216 feet thick, according to the human standard used by the angel. The wall was made of jasper, and the city was pure gold. I'll let you know these, some of these words of like emeralds and rubies. I'm not going to be able to read them well, so don't judge me. Uh, as clear as glass, the wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with the 12 precious stones. First was jasper, the second sapphire, third a gate, emerald, onyx, carnelian, uh, chrysolite, uh, beryl, topaz, uh, chrysophrase, I think, praise, whatever. Uh, the 11th was jacinth, and the 12th amethyst. And then the 12 gates were made of pearls, each gate from a single pearl, and the main street was pure gold, as clear as glass. It's like, I just, again, I want to reiterate how big God is and how amazing his creation is. What he has planned for us is insane in the best way possible. It is so good. And that, that is his heart for his kids. That is his heart for his people. It's like, I want you, I want you to have the best, Right? So is heaven an actual place? Absolutely it is. And as followers of Jesus, we get to go experience that actual place. One is paradise and two for eternity on this renewed earth with our Savior. So praise God for that, okay? So this is the first, first question. Is it an actual place? A few more questions because some of you guys are in here and you're like, hey, when I came in uh, wondering about heaven, like I love that it's an actual place, looking forward to it, but the serious stuff, I need to know the really important stuff. Pastor Ricky, will my pet be with me in heaven, Okay. <laughs> I need to know. Here's your answer. Cats, chihuahuas, gnats, flies, mosquitoes. No, okay? None of that. No. And here's what's going to happen. If we get up there and any of those things are up there, I'm starting a petition, okay? I'm like, God, I know you said it was perfect, but I just have a little bit of an opinion. Probably wrong, but can we see? No. Um, Truthfully, we don't know. We don't exactly know. We do know, and it says in Scripture, that animals will be in heaven, but your pet specifically depends on how they behave, okay? Um, so some, uh, let me give you <laughs> just a little bit, okay? Isaiah, Isaiah 11, verse 6 says this, In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion, and the little child will lead them all. Do you see that picture of peace? 
the removal of violence and aggression and all that that's in it. It's like, again, we understand now that's just the way that God made things and it's the circle of life, but, but God does a different thing up there, right? With us in, in heaven, this renewed earth, it's like, it's going to look different. So much peace, just beauty that, that the lion and the lamb and the wolf and the lamb and the leopard and the baby goat and, and the, the child will lead them on. Just such a cool picture. So also it, it goes on in Isaiah 65 to, to reiterate that. So we see in eternity, it looks like we will have animals with us. Again, do we know every detail to that? No, we don't. But it looks like they will be with us. So just pray hard for your pet, okay? We'll see. <laughs> so will my pet go to heaven? We hope so, right? The next thing, don't know but we hope so. Uh, do we keep our memory in heaven? Okay. Do we keep our memory of what we've gone through on earth and all the experience we've had, the people we know? Do we remember this stuff uh, in heaven? And so, uh, again, we don't know every detail of the memories we keep and what God might do because I, I do believe God will come in and any memory that is of, of pain or harshness or, or struggle, I think, again, we've read that God wipes away every tear, right? He heals us completely, and I believe he's going to heal the brokenness that comes with those memories. So I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I do believe we will remember, okay? And here's where this, we get this idea from. Uh, you have this moment uh, between King Saul. We know who King Saul is, right? King before King David. Uh, and this moment between uh, King Saul and Samuel and a, a medium, a lady who, who, who brings people back from the dead, basically, uh, so they can communicate, right? Uh, and so Saul has this moment after Samuel passes away where he needs to talk with Samuel. He's like, I need Samuel's wisdom. I need his help. Samuel's already passed away. So he goes to the medium. Is like, help me talk to Samuel. Saul's asking for that. And so here's what happens. The lady makes it happen, and, and Samuel comes back, uh, and he sees Saul and this lady, and this is what he says in verse 15 of uh, 1 Samuel 28. He says, why have you disturbed me by calling me back? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, again, back to like a nap. You ever wake up? It's like, hey, what's up, man? Imagine being on like vacation, a much needed vacation, and you get a call from work. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's probably how Samuel, he's like, dude, come on. It's like, not today. It's my day. It's my time off. You know, I've done my part. So why have you disturbed me by calling me back? Samuel asked Saul. Because I am in deep trouble, Saul replied. The Philistines are at war with me, and God has left me and won't reply by prophets or dreams. So I've called for you to tell me what to do. But Samuel replied, why ask me since the Lord has left you and has become your enemy? The Lord has done just, excuse me, ooh, puberty. The Lord has done just as he said he would. He has torn the kingdom from you and given it to your rival, David. <laughs> so, excuse me. Um, so, a few things right here, okay? First thing, we see that when Samuel comes back, he remembers Saul. Do you see that? He remembers who Saul is. He's like, oh, you, why have you disturbed me? Like, I was gone and done with this place, and you just had me come back. Like, what do you guys want from me? He didn't show up and go, who are you guys? He's like, why have you disturbed me? Not only does he remember Saul, but he also remembers the experiences from life. He remembers, and he says it there, the fact that Saul's anointing as king over Israel had been removed from God and that God was going to bring in David as the new king. He, rem he reminds Saul, he's like, hey, I'm dead and I remember. Do you remember what's going to happen? You know? So we see that moment. We see that, that that truth right there, that I do believe we will have our memory. We will remember uh, some of the experiences of life, and we will remember the people around us, which is such a great thing, amen? It's like, we want to we wanna remember our people. That's a, that's a very big thing. It's like, am I going to remember those people I loved, my friends, my family? All, are they going to know me when we get to heaven? Uh, and so that actually leads us to our next question. I do believe we'll have the memory, but what do our re earthly relationships look like in heaven? What do these relationships look like when we get up there, right? And so usually when we talk about relationships, we think of uh, like husband and wife, brother and sister, father and son, and all these things kind of that come with a title to them, right? A covenant is made because of, uh, yeah, whether it's a workplace, whether it's marriage, whether it's a job, whether, you know what I mean? It's like it's, it's birth, whatever. Um, there becomes these, ti we receive these titles here on earth. And so what will that look like in heaven? Uh, and I... I personally would say, and I think we can, we'll see this in scripture here, is that we still will have relationship with people, okay? And what I mean by that is those relational connections that we had here on earth will still be very important to us. Again, we will remember our people and we'll be excited to see them, but I don't think that that relationship will look the same. It won't hold the same covenant, the same title, and the same kind of boundaries that it did while here on earth, if that makes sense. So here's where we get this from, okay? A couple parts of scripture. The first one is just Jesus talking to us. It's always good when Jesus talks to us, amen? So the first one is Matthew 22, verse 30. For when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor, get, nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. No wings, okay? But he says this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven, okay? So when we get to heaven, it says, 
we're not going to be married to our spouse. We will not remarry. We will not, that won't be a thing anymore. So again, we get there, still have a relationship, but it won't be the same. Again, those covenants, those titles, those things will not be over the relationship like they were here on earth, but they will still matter and we'll still remember. And here's where that comes in. Uh, it's this moment in 2 Samuel with King David. Okay, So if you know this story, uh, King David makes a decision he shouldn't have, and there's a, a situation that happens with his son because of his choice, and his son becomes very sick and is about to die. Um, King David is overwhelmed to the max, and he does not want his son to die. And so he begins to beg and plead with God, please don't let my son die. Please let him live. Uh, to the point where he is fasting, not eating a single thing. Um, he was not changing clothes. He's not doing anything. His advisors are coming to him like, you got to eat. You got to do this. Like, you're a king. You can't do this. And he's like ignoring them completely right? Just so overwhelmed, understandably so. Uh, and so what happens is uh, David's son does end up passing away, okay? Uh, and when it happens, his advisors um, are scared to let David know because they're like, man, if this, if this guy was this upset before his son had actually passed away, imagine how distraught he's going to be when we tell him that he did end up passing away. So they're terrified. They don't want to tell him. Somehow it says in scripture, David overheard them, okay? And he knew. So he, he asked the question, hey, like, did my son pass away? And they're like, you know, yeah, he did. Uh, and so what happens after that, you know, they're imagining he's going to go crazy. This is going to be rough. David gets up, right, from just being on the floor begging God. He gets up. He changes his clothes, cleans himself up. He begins to eat again, and then begins to worship God. Just goes on. And, you know, if you're an advisor, you're like, what just happened? Why are you not freaking out? This is not what we expected at all. So here's what David says when they ask him, like, hey, what, what's going on? Like, why are you not responding the way we expected in 2 Samuel uh, 12, 22 and 23? It says, David replied, I fasted and wept while the child was alive, for I said, perhaps the Lord will be gracious to me and let the child live. But why should I fast when he is dead? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day, but he cannot return to me. Such a beautiful moment. Because what David is doing here and what he's revealing to us is there's this place again where we will remember, we remember the people that were here in this life with us when we go to eternity. So when we go to eternity, we'll be in a place of, I know who you are. He knew he would remember his son, that he would see his son again. It wasn't that his son was going to come back to him here. So he's like, hey, I don't, I don't need to be concerned about him coming back here because I have hope and I'm thankful for one, that one day I will get to go be with him because I will remember him. I know him. The relationship, again, might not look the same, but I will go be with him, and I will love him, and he will love me, and we will love each other as God's children. I think that's really it. We're going to be together and have a relationship as God's children. And I, I think also for anybody, if you've, if you've lost a loved one, um, that's encouraging. If you lost a loved one, if, if they have that faith in Jesus Christ to go, hey, like, I'm going to spend eternity with him, you, you're going to see them. You get to spend eternity with them. You know what I mean? Isn't that so cool? Get to hang out with them again and, you know, talk about, man, remember those days? <laughs> it's going to be great. And experience this renewed place and just enjoy all the things that God has for us. So praise God for that. Um, the way I see it, too, is uh, I have, like, a, a boss. I had a boss named Eddie. You know what I mean? It's like he was my boss. He no longer is my boss. I still have a relationship with him, though. He's still my friend. He just doesn't have that title in that relationship anymore. So the way we connect is not as if I was his employee anymore, but just a friend. So it's another way to look at it is we'll see it that way. And then one more side note about that. It's just this really cool thing. Um, we'll be, we will see our friends and family again in heaven that have already passed. Um, but also, um, for a lot of people, I know some moms and uh, dads have lost their babies. It's a very real thing. Uh, and we can be encouraged by the fact that because God is so good and he's so gracious and so kind, that David reveals to us here in this passage, God reveals to us through David's situation, that those babies will be in heaven. And you will get to see those beautiful babies again. Praise God. It's going to be a great thing. So, very good. So, that's, uh, those are our questions, right? So, again, we had, is heaven an actual place? Will my pets go? We don't know. Do we keep our memory? And what will those relationships look like when we get to heaven? So, what does this all mean for me right now? Like, what, what should I be really focused on when it comes to heaven right now? Because I think, as humanity, we, we have a tendency to swing to two different sides of the pendulum really far, Okay. And what we call this is the here and now on one side versus the then and there on the other side, okay? So here's what this is. If you're, if you're somebody who's all about the here and now, then you are so stuck on and you're clinging to and focused on this life here on earth, okay? 
We, this, this life here on earth is a beautiful thing. It's a blessing from God, right? Um, but we see this as just about everything. We see it as almost the only thing. We forget, if we're here and now, people, that God has an eternity, that our life here on earth is this big compared to the rest of eternity, right? We lose sight of that. And so we cling to here and now. We cling to the things of here and now. We cling to the house, the car, the boat, the thing, you know what I mean? The experiences, all that stuff. Not saying it's all bad, but we cling to it like it's the only thing. And we, one, one other thing we do is we, we focus on a legacy. You ever seen, you know, the, uh, the Sandlot? We've all seen Sandlot, you know what I'm saying? It's like Babe Ruth talks to Benny the Jet, and he's like, heroes get remembered, but legends never die. You know what I mean? It's like, probably, yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's like, probably not the greatest piece of advice, <laughs> but it's like, he tells him that, and it's like, and it made me think, it's like, okay, but like, should we want, should our goal just be to be remembered? It's like, no way, right? Because it's not about us. It's not. You matter more than you understand to Jesus. That's what matters. But it's not about leaving a legacy behind. It's not about being remembered so that people can look back. Well, do you remember Ricky? Man, he was great. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's not about that, right? But sometimes we make it about that. And that's, that's the here and now mindset. It's like, it's, it's here, it's now, it's this world. And we, we talk about death and we're like, oh, no way. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to, uh, just fear and we just avoid it. And we, you know what I'm saying? You ever been there? You know, like whether that's you or somebody, that's a real thing. Okay? It's a very real thing. If you've been there, you're not alone. If you are there, you're not. So that's here and now. The other side, again, is the then and there. Some of us could care less about here and now. Like, we see this world and its brokenness, and we're like, dude, I just want to get the heck out of here. You know, Jesus, you can come back right now. Let me put my shoes on. I'm ready. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm, I just want to go. And it is, again, we talked about Ecclesiastes, and it's built into us to desire that, to long for that, and that's good. But when we absolutely just forget that God has plans for us here is when it starts to get weird, that God has a purpose for us here, that we forget about all the other people that God placed here, that we're so focused because we're still focused on just I, me, time to get out of here. That's not it either. We lose sight. So I'd say, again, both of these would be wrong, okay? But ultimately, I think they're also right when you put them together the right way. And so uh, here's what I mean by that. I think that if we are going to get this right, how, how heaven should matter to us now, and the way we make it work is by redefining what it looks like to live for eternity. Redefine living for eternity, okay? Here's, here's what I mean by this. So in the book of Philippians, the apostle Paul says this. In uh, chapter 1, verse 21 through 24, he says, For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live... I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me, right? It would, praise God, it would be great. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Like, what is, what's he talking about? Is he just saying that we need him or something like that? I don't know. I think what Paul does is he reveals the solution here to this this here and now versus then and there issue. And, and, and he redefines what it means to live for eternity. Paul realizes that it's not that one option is good and the other is bad, right? Or it's not that both options are bad. In fact, Paul realizes that both ends of the spectrum, when you put them together in the middle and you combine them in the right way, it's a win-win. If I die today, praise God. Like, what? If I die today, praise God. You remember what we just talked about heaven, that place? Sounded crazy cool, yeah? It's like, praise God, I get to go be in paradise today, free from all the struggles that I've ever had, free from the sin, free from the brokenness. I get to be with Jesus. Praise God. Praise God if I, if I die today, if, if, if it's then and there. Praise God. If it's here and now, if, I, if God's like, hey, you got to stay, you're, you're living for a little bit longer, it's like, praise God. Praise God, because that means, and you're like, at the end there, Paul says, for your sake, he's not just saying like, yeah, you guys need me. No, no, no. Paul's saying that God has equipped him and called him and that he gets to go out and he gets to lead more people to Jesus. Praise God. He gets to be used as a vessel by the Lord to help other people become followers of Jesus Christ. And he's saying that is what matters. The reason that both ends of these are a win-win is because if I go, I'm with Jesus. If I stay, I get to make sure more people go to Jesus. That's the most important thing. That's why we're here. 
so we can lead people to Jesus Christ. Does that mean the rest of our life and our experience and our vacations and all this stuff, does that mean that they're all trash? No, 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 it doesn't mean that. I believe God is kind and generous and he gives us stuff and he just takes care of us. But I do believe that he gives us that stuff for a purpose as well. I don't believe that God just gives us stuff so that we can just use it and cling to it. He gives it to us for his glory. He wants it to be used for his glory so that more people can know him. So here's, here's an example of this. When I a little while, a few years ago, excuse me, um, Rachel and I, there was a student who attended GSM, um, and his name was Ryan, and he's a really awesome dude, and he's just an outstanding student, and he, uh, he did come from a pretty broken place, had some struggles, um, and was just really upset with his kind of circumstance, um, upset at the world, upset at God, and didn't really understand why everything looked the way it did in his life, um, and Rachel and I just felt called to really just invest in Ryan, to love on him, and to be there for him as much as we possibly could, and so uh, we did exactly that. We did what we felt like God called us to do. And um, there was a season where Ryan's uh, mom had to work outside of uh, uh, home. So she had to work out of the state, actually, of Oklahoma. And she was um, doing a bigger job somewhere else. And Ryan didn't really have the motivation. Like, he lived out alone in, like, you know, rural Oklahoma, but didn't have a ride to get to school and, like, to other things. He played basketball, couldn't get there, all kinds of stuff. So, like, things were kind of a struggle for him. And so um, Rachel and I just had been praying, like, wondering how we could help. And we felt like God had called us to give Ryan a truck that we owned. Um, this is a truck that was given to me when I was in high school um, by my best friend's parents. Um, and so I was like, hey, that doesn't sound right. You know, it's like, God, you want us to give up a vehicle? It's like, yeah, I do. I want you to give it to Ryan. Uh, and uh, we did. We gave the truck to Ryan. And I don't tell you that because I want you to be like, wow, Pastor Ricky's great. It's not about me. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'll tell you the truth. I like that truck. <laughs> it's, it's a nice truck. But we felt called to do it. And so we, we did our best to obey our Heavenly Father, and we gave Ryan the truck. And, and our hope was, again, not that Ryan looked back at us and was like, wow, I just love you guys so much. Thank you so much. It's like, yeah, we wanted a relationship with him. We wanted him to know that we were here for him no matter what. But ultimately, we wanted him to see Jesus Christ in the midst of that. We wanted him to see his Savior who loves him more than he can understand or imagine. We wanted him to know that God provides for him, that it was not us, but God that provided for him. That God wants to use other people in our lives to help us. We wanted him to see Jesus and to give his life to him, to know that he is always there for him and with him. That's, that's what we're called to do right now. We've got a lot of soldiers here at Grace Fellowship Church, right? We're, we're a military church and we're thankful for it. We praise God for it, um, for, for our community, for our church, for our friends, um, and for all that you guys do for us. Um, and a lot of you soldiers and, and uh, anybody in the military, right? Marines, Navy, all you guys know um, what it is to, to get deployed, okay? Um, and I'll say this, okay, a little disclaimer. None of us civilians know what that's like at all. And we can never attempt to know what that's like. So I just want you to know that as I say what I'm about to say. It's like, this is not me trying to act like we've been in your shoes because we haven't. And again, we thank you for all that you do. Um, but if you've been deployed, you know that you you went to take care of a mission, to complete a task, to complete a goal. And eventually there was going to be a day that you got to go home and be with your family. And the task, the mission would be complete. And you looked forward to the day that you went home, that you got to be home with your family. You smiled about that day when you thought about it. But in the midst of your mission, you know that things needed to be done. You know that there was stuff going on there on deployment that mattered and had to be taken care of. And so you did what you had to do. That's, that's where we are as followers of Jesus. God has placed us here in this world. And there's so much to it because, again, he's such a big God and he's such a kind God. But it's, it's like we're on this mission. And the mission is people. God has called us to love people, to lead people to him. And you're like, okay, but this world is broken. I know. That's why we long for home. We long for home. We love people now. We've got to. We're called to. We've got to lead people to Jesus, to be Christ's ambassadors, to represent him well so that more people can know him and follow him. But ultimately, one day we all get to go home. And that's what we look forward to. But we can't neglect the mission. We can't forget what God is calling, calling us to here and now because both are a win. Both are praise God moments. That's what it's about, church. That's what matters. That's, that's what our focus should be right now as we think about heaven. That's what living for eternity should really look like for us right now. You guys want to stand up? We're getting ready to close out. So just really quick, there might be, you might be in one of two places today, um, or some of us might be, um, for some of us, as we talk about heaven and we talk about eternity, um, it's something we know about, we've heard about, you know what I mean? Um, 
But I don't know about you guys, even if I've heard something a thousand times, I often lose sight of what I've been taught and kind of wander off in a different direction. You guys know what I'm saying? Um, and so for some of us, we're in that spot today where when it comes to eternity, we've either swung far on the pendulum one way to say, I'm all about here and now, or on the pendulum the other way and said, I'm all about then and there. And I've just started to neglect what God might be doing here right now and just kind of leave it be. So maybe you're in one of those spots today. I just want to remind you quickly, it's, it's not too late to get back on track. It's never too late to get back on track with God and to what he has called us to do, to start loving each other. Now, maybe today the simple thing you can do as we worship is think about one person that you can start loving differently, that you can start teaching and being an example of Christ to. Maybe that's it for you today. And the, the others of us in the room, it's like, maybe we've never really thought about eternity. Maybe you just got drugged to church today and I'm, I'm glad that you're here, okay? We, we're glad that whoever brought you brought you. That's the truth. Um, and if that's you and you're like, this church thing just isn't me and I'm just still kind of uncomfortable with it, that's okay. Again, we're just glad you're here. Um, but if you're in that spot and maybe you haven't made Jesus Lord of your life, I want you to know that everything we talked about is available to you freely. That salvation through Jesus Christ has been available for you since day one. That he paid the price for you. That this whole, this whole trip that we get to go on, whether that's paradise and later to eternity, the, the, the new heaven, new earth, um, that's for you. And it's free. And that's because there's a God who loves you and cares for you and who made a way. You don't have to do anything except say yes. And I want to remind you also that it is never too late, okay? Not until the day we go, it's not, too, it's not too late to say yes to Jesus Christ. And he's here. He's waiting. He's not pushy. He's just here. And he loves you. So whether that's here at the altar, that's there in your seat, that's with somebody praying, God's waiting. And we should keep moving, right? Amen? Keep moving toward him. Let's pray, church. Jesus, thank you so much for today. God, I thank you for all that you do, God, and who you are and how much you love us. And, and for your creation, God, this this idea of paradise and, and, and this, this new renewed earth, God, the future heaven that we get to experience, God, it all represents you, God. It represents your heart, your character for your people, God, because you love us so much that you want to give us the best. You want to provide the best for us. You want to perfect us, God, and, and get rid of all of the stuff that, that brings brokenness, all the stuff that, that, that comes out from sin, God, all the pain, the hate, the frustration, the anger, all those things, God, you just want to want to heal them. You want to heal us, and you want to be with us. So Lord, I pray that today, Lord, whatever might be in the way of us making a, a choice, making a step that you've called us to, that those walls are broken down, that those chains are broken, that we're freed in Jesus' name, and that we can move in the direction you're calling us to. We thank you for eternity. We thank you for paradise. We thank you for here and now and all that you're doing and all that you want to do through us. Have your way. It's in your perfect and powerful name we pray, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen.